You are listening to the Choose Your Struggle Podcast, a member of the Shameless Podcast Network. This week on the Choose Your Struggle Podcast, it's actress and head of the suicide prevention organization Breaking Taboo, Serena Hope's son, but first, Kid Mental, let's go. Things ain't always gonna go our way, but you can always win when you choose your struggle. And some battles will be yesterday, but today is for a new weekend. Choose your struggle, and don't worry about what they say. But you can always win when you choose your struggle, and you can bounce back. Yes, that's true. Come on and listen in to choose your struggle. Choose your struggle. Choose your struggle. Choose your struggle. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Choose Your Struggle podcast. This is Jay Schiffman, and I am glad that you're here. This week's episode of the show features another really heartfelt conversation around the topic of suicide. My guest is actress, producer, speaker, and founder of the organization Breaking Taboo, Serena Hope's son, She, as you'll hear her talk about, started this organization after losing more than one person in her life to suicide, having suicidal ideations herself, and just deciding, you know what, there's not enough being done here. I'm going to launch this organization to help. Uh, They're doing some really incredible work around breaking stigma, or, or as they say, breaking taboo, which I love. And she is, I found her very interesting. I found the conversation fascinating. Uh, And I am very appreciative of the work that they are doing. Uh, As you'll hear us talk about on here, uh, another example of what I love to highlight of people who go through something traumatic and decide that they want to use this experience to make a difference. Uh, I I identify with that and and I want to support people like that as much as possible uh, because it's those of us with this lived experience that can really put, you know, a, a, an empathetic face on these experiences. And, and you hear me talk about this a lot. I never want to minimize the incredible work being done by researchers, by people who just simply care about these issues. However, I do always want to prioritize uh, giving the the voice in, in the platform and the opportunity to to people who have the lived experience because we can talk about it in a different way uh and and that is again what this week is so thank you to Serena Hope's son uh for you and your entire organization all that you're doing thank you for taking the time this week I, I think our conversation was fantastic and uh, yeah, short intro. I think I want to save more of the time for Serena. So without further ado, enjoy this episode. Enjoying the podcast? Consider supporting it on Patreon. You'll get behind the scenes looks, sneak peeks, extra bonus content, and best of all, a way to interact with me, your host. You'll also get discounts on merch like tank tops and magnets and all the other services I provide, like booking me to speak, coach or consult, or even advertise here on the podcast. Check it out in the show notes or in patreon.com slash choose your struggle. Plans start at as little as $3.40 a month, and all the money goes right into the podcast. All right, let's get back to the show. Thanks for sharing the podcast with your friends. If you're listening on Apple, please rate and review or check out the review link in the show notes. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. (laughs) Sure. Thank you so much for having me, Jay. Uh, I am Serena Sun, uh, also known as Serena Hope Sun. I am both a creative and a creator. So I consider myself a serial entrepreneur as well as a serial creative. I am the founder and CEO of the mental health and suicide prevention nonprofit Breaking Taboo. And I am also an actor and producer and director in the entertainment industry, as well as a writer and musician and a life coach. (laughs) So I do quite a few things. Uh, Yeah. Wow. When do you find time for sleep? There is so much in there. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as a mental health advocate and being in uh, the mental health field, I, you know, know a lot about how to uh, keep our mental health um, better, I guess, how to maintain my own mental health. And then I have the life coaching aspect. I have a, a whole background in psychology and personal development. So through that background, I understand how to be productive, how to stay motivated, how to get things done, how to meet your goals, how to set goals, all that stuff. Uh, so I just kind of combine the two together. And definitely, you can usually find me working. Um, <laughs> I uh, don't want to say I'm a workaholic, uh, but there's just always so much to do. And I just happen to naturally be um, interested in so many different things and passionate about so many different things that I, I usually am always working on something. Um, so everything I do usually has some type of productivity to it, but I do make sure to give myself that wind down time. So at the end of the night, you know, I watch my favorite TV shows right now. It is actually the walking dead. <laughs> so don't ask me how I got into that, but, um, that right now, uh, before I go to sleep, I watch my little zombie TV show. Um, you know, when I do have time to uh, hang out with friends, I'll, I'll do that. I give myself, you know, uh, a day uh, at one day on weekend just to kind of relax. Uh, and if it doesn't happen to be one day, then I try to at least make sure that 12 hours is split between the two days of my weekend. Doesn't always happen, but I try my best to, to do that. Uh, but, you know, things that are important to me really are the relationships in my life. So I do make time for those that I love and I care about. And I think that's very important for our mental health. Well, that was an excellent intro. And as my listeners know, we will talk about self-care later. So hold on to some of those thoughts. But <laughs> before we get into all of that, we need to hear your story. Who is Serena's son and how did you get to be where you are today? Yeah. Oh, who is Serena Sun? <laughs> Besides what I just uh, told you, um, I'd say I'm a, a very curious, um, passionate, and uh, a genuine person. Um, people have told me that it's pretty easy to talk to me, and I tend to, you know, um, uh, advocate for things, many things. So I guess, you know, I'm an advocate at heart. I, I stand for causes. I, I get really, really passionate about causes and I kind of make that a part of my life. And, you know, there's always a reason to me doing the things that I do. Um, I'd like to think that I'm a pretty deep thinker. Uh, at least I'm told that I'm always thinking about things. <laughs> so um, on a deeper level, so I always try to find the meaning uh, a deeper meaning behind what it is that I do that like makes my life feel fulfilled and gives my life purpose, you know, so it's not just going to work. It's not just doing work. It's like, you know, I'm doing this for a, a reason. And, you know, all of these things that I do mean a lot to me. And I think that's so important to, to me personally, um, you know, self-care, mental health or not, it's just, it's just the way that I'm built. Uh, but, um, I am uh, an Asian American, specifically uh, Chinese American, although recently I've been thinking of, you know, why do we call it Asian American? Why don't we call it American Asian or American Chinese or American Italian or American Mexican? You know, I'm, I, it's like interesting to me, um, the, the usage of the, the terminology and the order of the, the words, because I know with a lot of people that have... Um, um, dual cultures, we sometimes struggle with uh, which culture, um, you know, we kind of we struggle with the duality of the two cultures. Uh, but I am a US citizen. So sometimes, um, you know, I feel like, you know, America is first. And, um, you know, so yeah, so that's, that's an interesting subject that I've been thinking about as of recently. Uh, but yeah, I am an Asian American, and I am very much involved in the mental health sector. Um, I have lost multiple friends to suicide. So that's how I got involved in suicide prevention. Uh, and I used to give seminars. Um, I still do in mental health, but I used to give seminars specifically on suicide prevention. Um, and uh, it was because I lost another friend of mine that I started breaking taboo because I basically got sick of losing people 
in my life to something that I know. The fact is suicides are 90% preventable. And that's something that people don't really know. But there are a lot of signs and symptoms uh, that, you know, right now I'm educating people on watching out for. And there is a lot of mental health involved in this type of last resort action. Uh, So, you know, that's why Breaking Taboo has its name. Because I realized that we have to concentrate on the actual root cause and the root cause is the taboo around all of these subjects. So, you know, people aren't going to speak out about this or get help about it if they feel like there's such a shame around it, you know, Um So it just doesn't help. So that's basically, you know, we focus a lot of our efforts on breaking this taboo and uh, also educating people on this stuff. Yeah. What else do you want? Well, to oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, first, first, first off, I'm sure there's a lot more and I'm excited to hear it. But first, I do want to say thank you um, there. You know, first off, well, two things I, I should say as someone who, number one, I, most of what I do is aimed at ending the stigma. I appreciate that, that you address that head head on. And we'll obviously talk about that in a little bit. But but even more so, as my listeners know, because I talk about this a lot, there's sort of two different types of people when it comes to this work. There are people who they go through something in in my case, you know, living through two suicide attempts, in your case, losing too many people because one person is too many people to suicide and just getting through it, just, just trying to heal is their mission. And that's wonderful. That's enough. That's all we can ask of them. But then there's a very small group of people who say, not only do I obviously need to heal myself, but I cannot sit by and allow more of this to happen. And and I obviously count myself as part of that group. And Mm -hmm. I love talking to people like yourself, who are also part of that, who see this issue and say, just taking care of myself, I feel empowered to do more. Uh, And that's, it sounds like that's where your work comes from. Yeah, absolutely. And just FYI, I have been there myself as well. I experienced depression growing up as an adolescent and I had no, I had absolutely no guidance around this whatsoever. There was no one I could really talk to except for my friend and my neighbor back then. I remember we went to our guidance counselor one day and we, we told her and she just gave us some pamphlets, you know, and was like, oh, tell your family to take you to therapy. And my family didn't believe in therapy back then, you know, there's such like the stigma is so strong. Um, So yeah, I mean, I cried myself to sleep every single night for the longest time or when I was in high school. Um, And that's also a thing for, uh, it's actually very prevalent. Suicide and depression is extremely prevalent for people of dual cultures, particularly first generation immigrant um, children. So that's something that people don't really know about, but there's, there's so much pressure and so much, um, identity issues uh, with that. Um, But yeah, I mean, I've been through it myself too. And what actually snapped me out of it was losing my first friend to suicide, unfortunately. So So yeah. Talk to us then, because as my listeners know, part of this show is being vulnerable and sitting with that pain for a minute. What was that experience experience like for you when this issue that everybody at some point in their lives, whether whether they have suicidal thoughts or ideations themselves, will be forced to deal with, whether it's somebody that they know close or or um, a national figure, you know, let's say a Robin Williams who they lose and they go, wow, I had no idea. What was that like for you the first time this came into your life in such a personal way? Uh, What do you mean? You mean the losing of my friend or me personally? Uh, Yes, the first time that you lost a a friend to suicide. Um, hmm. It was shocking. It was numbing. Uh, He he had already graduated. So, um, you know, but I remember, I mean, he was always just, you know, so happy and he had a lot of friends, very sociable. So that's a common misconception. A lot of people think that people who are depressed, you can tell that they're depressed. And um, that's actually often not the case. Like a lot of times people are very good at keeping it in themselves. And, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe they have so many friends because it's like, that's like their only outlet, you know, so you don't know what's going on at home. You don't know what's going on, like internally, but he had already graduated. And I remember I was sitting in school and there was a, um, 
because uh, he was a few years above me. And um, I heard it on a loudspeaker, actually. And it was our uh, principal or whomever was, you know, um, doing the loudspeaker during homeroom uh, saying, you know, let, now let's give a few mo- minutes to uh, uh, of silence to honor the life of my friend. And I remember I was just in shock because I had no idea. I had no idea um, that this happened. And um, uh, it was it was um, pretty heartbreaking. And I remember crying and I remember, you know, uh, my friends asking me if I was okay. And then like, I tried to go to gu- guidance counselor to see if there was anything, you know, that was going on. And they had like a little, like a tiny little support group. But I remember I wasn't really... It was like he had like a lot of different groups of friends and that one support group, uh, I didn't really know about it. By the time I found out, it was already happening. And I think like I like looked through the window and it was like a small group of people I didn't really know. And I didn't really feel comfortable talking about it back then. And that was it. And that was it. That was all the help that we had. You know, that was all the support system that we had. And then I just had to take it home. I remember I opened up back then we had like little address books. <laughs> um, I remember I had this cute little address book that I had all my friends like put their phone numbers stuff in. And it was the weirdest thing. I'm telling you, this is the strangest thing. But I opened up that address book and the first page that opened up was his. So I don't know. I mean, um, it's just it it was shocking and it was it was um I was definitely very sad about it and I I didn't know what to do and um I don't know I can't remember that much of what happened after but I do know that it it kind of like gave me the reality seeing seeing the people and feeling this about him and just like I mean, I remember just feeling like what uh, what a damn shame it was that that this person was gone you know, I just remember thinking like, wow, he had so much talent and potential and so many people loved him. And it was just, it, I just felt like what a shame. Like, I just couldn't believe it. I didn't know why he did it. And um, and then seeing his friends also, like the people that did know him, because a lot of people did, um, you know, seeing what they were going through as well. I think that really helped me in snapping myself out of me wanting to die. You know, because I had a death wish for a very long time. So, um, or as an adolescent, at least, <laughs> it felt like a long time at the at the time. But so I was one of the lucky ones, I think, where the suicide of someone else actually made me uh, realize the impact of what it had on others and, and gave me like a different perspective of it where it made me not want to go down that path. Um, but there is something called suicide clusters. And unfortunately, very often it happens the other way, where if one person in our community dies of suicide, it actually unfortunately affects the community so that more people uh, see it as a viable option and it causes or not causes but it, it actually can lead to more suicides and that's a phenomenon called suicide clusters and it's very real so let's before before we literally get into into some of that work i want to sort of finish this this section on uh, talking specifically about your story so you you know, you have this first person that you've lost and, and you, that was in, when you were young, you go to school, you start your career. What finally made you go, okay, I need to do more. I need to dedicate at least a, a solid part of my life to this work. Uh, yeah. Um, I would say that it was the loss of another friend. Uh, of mine who uh, was in the entertainment industry. He was um, probably one of the most talented musicians I had ever um, known in in my lifetime. And I guarantee you, everyone that's heard him play will will say that. Um, And again, someone with so much potential, with so many friends who's relatively well known, you know, um, I've been on like, you know, hundreds or if not like dozens of of records, at least, you know, with a, a really you know just amazing people and amazing talent and there's just it seems like you know um, people have like everything going for them um but they don't and um you know and and basically unfortunately um he uh jumped off of a three-story parking lot and um yeah and that really shocked me that really shocked me because uh this person was responsible for me 
getting into jazz, <laughs> basically, who was like the sole person responsible for me discovering jazz music. I had known him uh, for um, uh, like a, a long time, over 10 years. And, um, you know, it's just it, it was just shocking. And I found out later because I kind of lost touch with him um, for like a, about like a year or so. We're just kind of like, you know, me doing my career, he doing his. And, you know, we'd always see each other in like gatherings and whatnot. But I didn't know. I kind of wish that I was there more in that point of his life. Um, because what I did not know was that his brother had just died of suicide uh i think a year or a year and a half before and again that's where the suicide cluster like that's basically you know um a, a possible example of that um and i did not know that he was having such a hard time dealing with that so a part of me kind of felt bad for not really being in his life now then um and also he knew that i had a background in suicide uh prevention and and you know psychology and all of this and i just I, I was living with survivor's guilt after that for a very long time. And I think a part of um, breaking taboo was to heal myself from that survivor's guilt from like, okay, this sucks. I don't want to ever have to go through this again. I don't want other people to have to go through this again. Like, I, I just don't want this to happen again, you know, period. Um, so yeah. So I remember after, after his death, I, I went through, uh, a short spout of um, depression again. I mean, I say depression only because it lasted longer than two weeks, you know, like the clinical diagnosis. Uh, but, you know, in reality, it could have very well just been like a very deep form of mourning, you know. Um, but it was scary. That was a scary period for me as well. And it was very painful. And uh, I was struggling with it for quite some time for like a, about a year um, or so. So uh, yeah, so I, I remember I had this light bulb moment when I was just thinking about, you know, all the suicides that were happening and just thinking like, why is it that we have all these resources, but people just don't, you know, people just aren't doing anything about it. Like we have so many resources and we have so many, not so much knowledge. Psychology has been around for a long time. Like, but why are people not really getting this knowledge? You know, why is, why is this not common knowledge for people? So that's where I had the light bulb moment of it's the taboo. And also that if I could, if I can break this taboo, then I, I'll have a better chance of getting this knowledge out on the table for everyone. So, um, yeah, so it was kind of like a dual purpose thing. So yeah, that's basically what led me to breaking taboo. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for that vulnerability that, that you could, you could hear it in the way you talked about it, how, how deeply that sat with you. And before we get into, uh, what breaking taboo looks like, what this incredible work you're doing, uh, literally is, Let's stop real quick. Let's pause and give my listeners a chance to learn where they can follow you online. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> so you can follow my social. I'm still working on my website because I spend so much time working on the Breaking Taboo website that I always put my own personal website on the back burner. Uh, but I do have a domain. So when it comes out, the domain is serena Sun. Dot com. Uh, but for now, you can find me on my socials at Serena Hope Sun on Instagram and Serena Hope Sun on Facebook and Serena Hope Sun on Twitter. And yes, I do go by Serena Hope Sun as well. In fact, there's more about me on Google and stuff um, under that name, Serena Hope Sun. Uh, and then as for Breaking Taboo, you can check out our website, breaking-taboo.org. Uh, Instagram is at Breaking Taboo, Facebook at Breaking Taboo, Pinterest Breaking Taboo Org, and Twitter is Breaking Under, oh, sorry, Breaking Tab, wait, yes, Breaking Underscore Taboo. There's <laughs> so many to keep track of. Um, and we're also on YouTube as well. So yeah, and TikTok, and TikTok. We just joined TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I am so excited to tell you about my new CBD sponsor, Roadrunner. Y'all know I love my old CBD sponsor, and I switched for one main reason. This stuff 
works. I've been a runner my whole life, but unfortunately I'm also super easily injured. One of my high school friends used to call me Mr. Glass. And back in 2015, when I ran my first half marathon, I got hurt, like really hurt. And since then I haven't been able to run more than three or four miles without serious pain. That is until I tried Roadrunner CBD's Muscle Gel. In a few short months, I'm regularly running five and a half to six miles each outing, and I'm currently training for my next half marathon. I don't want to call it a miracle cure, but it's damn near close. So check it out at my personal Roadrunner link, which is roadrunnercbd.com slash ref slash CYS. Again, that's roadrunnercbd.com slash ref slash CYS, or at the link in my show notes or on my podcast website, and use the code CYS at checkout to get 10% off on all of their awesome products. Check it out today. Subscribe to my Patreon for behind the scenes looks at the podcast, sneak peeks, and bonus data. You'll also get a discount on Choose Your Struggle merch. Find it at patreon.com slash choose your struggle. So, you know, we are now at the section of the show where I really want to dive into the work that you and your organization do. So uh, you, you, you told us a little bit of, the, of founding the organization just before the break. Uh, you know, from day one, talk us through what was the goals of this organization and what you sought out to, to accomplish with this organization. Yeah. So from day one, it was to break the taboo around mental health and suicide prevention um, uh, while providing accessible education to the general public. So that's kind of like our, our mission statement as a, as a whole. Um, so in order to provide this education, we have to first start by breaking the taboo. That's why we're so active on social media platforms and whatnot, because we want to talk to especially, you know, millennials and Gen Zs and people that use, you know, social media and smartphones. Um, you know, we want to, uh, uh, pr uh, promote mental health in a way that is not scary and is not like weird and and is you know normal because I always say like we all have mental health <laughs> it's um kind of you know odd if we want to avoid our mental health because we can't really our mental health is just the health of our minds um so we we do a lot of work on on social media uh, we also have um, we also have uh, our documentary that we're working on. So the documentary actually came before the nonprofit, uh, and then like the ball got rolling so much with the documentary that I realized, okay, wow, like this is even bigger than I thought. So then I started the nonprofit. Uh, but the documentary is very much the same. Uh, we've gotten so many executive produce or executive directors and uh, of uh, other mental health organizations as well as you know substance abuse centers um, and all sorts of places like healing centers. Uh, we've gotten them on uh, our documentary already. Uh, we've done interviews with, you know, people that have struggled with mental health, um, people that have lost people to mental health. Uh, and we still have a whole other round of filming to do. Um, so currently right now, that is our biggest project that we are raising funds for is to finish up this documentary because let's face it, it's, it takes an army to create a movie <laughs> and it ain't cheap. So uh, so a lot of our funds right now are, are dedicated to that. Um, and we also provide uh, education to other various media forms. So we have our YouTube channel. Uh, we have our own podcast that I actually started during quarantine, uh, as many other people did. Uh, but, you know, on our podcast, we just open up the conversation, much like what you're doing, Jay, uh, with people uh, around all sorts of mental health topics. Um, and then we have our educational content on our YouTube uh, videos and whatnot. And we have a lot of articles, too. So our website, we constantly have coming out with articles um, uh, on uh, various uh, subjects of mental health. And usually we try to keep it somewhat current, you know, so around current events. So we just had one, um, uh, well, actually, the, uh, this is about a year ago on the psychology of racism, um, you know, when the whole BLM movement was happening and the uh, Stop Asian Hate stuff. And then we have, um, uh, uh, let's see, we had ones on uh, coping with change, you know, so how to cope with COVID and self love and, uh, uh, everything from, you know, how to recognize depression to how to talk to someone's depression 
to just how to love yourself. So our articles are very varied. We have tons of articles on our website. And recently, uh, we just started to open a personal article section. So that's getting built right now. Uh, there's actually a lot of things that are getting built on our website right now. So we're going to have a bunch new, uh, bunch of new sections. Uh, and one of it is personal articles where people can submit and um uh, it talk about their own personal mental health journeys so that we can, you know, really build a community around this. Um, let's see, what else are we doing? Oh, mental health days, mental health days. So yeah, so right now we just part, uh, partnered with uh, the MTV um, Mental Health Action Day. Oh, we're going to be a part of that. But um, as for us, we have been building mental health days for schools. So um, hopefully that'll be coming up soon as well. Although right now it's a little bit difficult to see where the schools are going when they like open up again. Um, but yeah, so we'll have educational uh, programs at schools around mental health um and uh, possibly some you know nationwide mental health days of our own yeah so that's what we're up to currently i'm, I'm probably leaving some stuff out <laughs> but i can't really keep track of everything it's like uh as you know I, there's a lot going on um so yeah <laughs> Well, that doesn't surprise me uh, that you guys are doing a lot of work because, the, the, you know, the, the topic demands it. There is a lot to be done. So let's kind of talk about that for a second, because uh, someone way smarter than me once described uh, talking about suicide as a, like a second layer of stigma, because not only is mental health difficult to talk about uh, in, in our communities, but then the topic of suicide has that second layer of stigma on top of it. And part of that, as as these incredible educators said, is the misconception uh, going back to something you were talking about with the clusters uh, that that simply talking about suicide is what created that. And instead, it was it was talking about it incorrectly, talking about it in a harmful way. So how do you start these conversations? How do you uh, go to whether it's schools, as you were just saying, or, or really wherever you're doing this, and say, hey, we want to talk about this incredibly difficult topic of suicide? Um, That's a great question. And um, I don't really think there is a quote unquote right way to start a conversation. I think the key point is just to start it. When I go to schools and I talk about this, uh, well, typically they already know what the subject is on because <laughs> the teacher or the school or the assembly, you know, um, tells them like, hey, today we're going to be talking about suicide prevention or whatever. But, uh, you know, I just kind of jump right into it. Um, I kind of present the facts. Uh, you know, there's an element of like, you got to grab people's attention. And oftentimes what grabs people's attention are the actual facts around it. Um, but then there's also the relatability aspect because like you said before, Jay, like everyone almost has gone through these things. And as, as I always say, depression uh, is, is, you know, I don't think of depression as something that's um, so shameful because we all get really sad. Like we get sad. Life is about happiness and sadness. You know, it's like, that's what makes us human. And, um, you know, the, the more shame we put around it, like the, the, the worse it can get. Cause then we're blaming ourselves for feeling something uh, that, you know, we are absolutely supposed to be feeling as a human being. Um, so I think that's where a lot of uh, the the work comes in is removing that shame, removing that like stigma, right, or, around this. Um, but yeah, you know, I asked some questions and like when they felt sad before and like when they've experienced this, I try to get, you know, audience participation. Um, you know, uh, sometimes we'll play like games around it, but I don't, I mean, I feel like, well, let me go back to the suicide cluster thing. Okay, so there has been research that has shown that when uh, the suicides go down, um, when it doesn't become a suicide cluster, uh, it all depends on how the media reports this and, yes, how it's talked about and how it's perceived. So if it's glamorized, if suicide is glamorized, then, yes, it can lead to uh, people contemplating more suicides. But if it's shown in a way of like how it's impacted the family, how it's impacted the friends. So kind of like what happened to me in like seeing and experiencing the impact that it had on other people and just how much it sucked. Like when that happens, when the media starts to talk about those things and concentrate on what it leaves behind, that's when it actually helps. That's when it's actually helpful 
to preventing suicide. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, really well, well put. And, and I think that, again, that that's so important to specify that the incorrect notion or or the harmful idea that simply talking about suicide at all uh, makes people commit suicide. That is what a lot of people who want to see less conversation around this uh, love to trumpet that stat or, or, or that that fact, and it's just flat out false. But as you just said, there are ways to do it that really can be healthy and can help and be helpful. Um, you know, I, I saw some a very interesting article not long ago that uh, the media's portrayal of, of suicide methods has been shown to be correlated with rises in those methods. Methods. And mm-hmm. so if, if instead we focus on, as you so perfectly just said, the human side of it, talking about as you know, people like you who, who have shared this experience, people like me who've lived through it and can say, I was there, let me tell you, you know, what, why I wouldn't make that mistake today. You know, these are healthy and helpful ways to discuss this issue. Yeah, yeah. And that's so interesting. I didn't, I would love to see that research, Jay, if you could email that to me after this call. But yeah, I mean, uh, interesting um, that the the media, uh, the, the way, uh, the methods that, that it shows. But yeah, I think you're, you're touching on uh, what I said, also the glamorizing aspect, right? Yeah, there is an area of glam- that, you know, this has been like an ongoing issue for the longest time, a controversy. The media definitely glamorizes things, um, including, you know, not just suicide sides but like drugs mafia crime all that stuff because they need to make it entertaining you know they need to make it something that people want to watch they don't want to turn people away from the tv so you know it's kind of like uh unfortunately that's the business um or entertainment side of it which i i can also understand being a creative artist i can understand that but yes there are absolutely like you can't do one and lack in the education you know of the other and and i do think that you know there are ways absolutely to present this even if you're like um presenting it in the media or shooting a movie or a film or whatever that has a scene of suicide like yes I think they could be a bit more conscientious of how they're going to show that scene because ultimately too every story every media story like there's I do believe that as an artist you do have a moral obligation you know some artists don't believe that some artists think like art is just art and that's it and that that is the obligation Um, I tend to believe that we do have an obligation to the society with the message that we choose to send out. So, yeah. Really well put. And, and I'm, I'm with you, you know, that's why I do, you know, what I do. And, and um, that has, you're right that there is that clash at times, um, you know, perfect example, I think is I've been on a podcast once where uh, the person who was interviewing me refused to call me anything other than sober, despite me telling her over and over again, I'm in recovery, but I'm not sober. Um, Because for her, you know, that was in her eyes, she had this moral obligation that I I felt was uh, ungrounded to say that only being sober was a way into recovery, which we disagreed on. But uh, it, it was almost like she was coming from a good place and it was hard to be angry with her because she truly believed this, you know, uh, hmm. but that that can be that can lead to really interesting um, uh, opportunities for, for discussion. So you and I could go on this for a while. And I, I'm learning so much from you, by the way. Thank you for all of your work. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're so thoughtful on this and so incredibly impassioned. And that's obvious, uh, by the way. I'm sure that you know that, that it, it comes out very easily. Oh, I but, don't know. I just talk. <laughs> I can talk a lot. <laughs> but but you're you're so clearly passionate. I I, I think I think it's pretty obvious. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'll take but that I as am, a compliment. I would hope so. I mean, you wouldn't be doing this. Like, look, none of us is getting rich off doing this work, right? So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, you know, there's the, it, that's coming from a personal development life coach part two, you know, and mixing that with a nonprofit. It is very interesting sometimes because I teach my own clients to like, you know, um, um, you know, not place limitations on themselves and go for the life that they want and, you know, be empowered and all that. And I do truly, really believe that. 
that. And I think that is actually a problem with the nonprofit sector. I really believe, and there's a great TED talk on this that that's an executive from another nonprofit actually sent to me. Um, but this, there's this great TED talk. It was passed around in the nonprofit world for for quite some time, and it was about. Um, oh my gosh, I, I wish are you, I could are you remember talking the name. about Dan Pallotta? Is it the one about how uh, he ran something? It was for like breast cancer or something. Dan right? Pallotta. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, so listeners, if 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 you're not aware of this, and I've talked about this on a couple other episodes already, so if you if you haven't heard those, uh, it it is a must watch for anybody who works in a nonprofit. By the way, uh, I, I my my past is over a decade in nonprofit, so oh. uh, I'm with you <laughs> on that. Um, or or someone who cares about being. Uh, involved in, in financially or as a volunteer, watch this and let it change your views of nonprofits. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the 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 main point, if you don't mind me giving it away, <laughs> please. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he basically he was just talking about how. Society at its current point right now um, is not rewarding good people for being good. So, so people who want to do good work are not getting rewarded financially, and it's kind of messed up. Because why are we rewarding people who who are, um, you know, uh, I don't want to use the word money hungry, but you know, like just like why are we not rewarding more, um, more? people out there, more work and more organizations out there that are, you know, actually doing things that have a greater good or a social benefit type of cause, aka like nonprofits. Um, And he was talking from his experiences of, uh, you know, using the, uh, the money that he got from his donors, um, and putting that into things that he thought would really like make this nonprofit grow, you know, and give this nonprofit like, you know, a more means to, to be more financially stable and bring out more awareness. So putting that into like mainstream business tactics, such as advertising, you know, and things like that. And then once his donors saw the, um, amount, so there's like the donor report, once they saw how, how much was going into these things ra- rather than like uh, the 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 work, right? I mean, Jay, maybe you you can um, correct me on on some of the details here. But once the donors uh, saw that, he basically lost all of his donors. Um, from what he claims, like it seemed like basically he lost them overnight is the word that he used. And all of a sudden their donations just dropped. All of these major uh, sponsors like stopped sponsoring them. Um, because they're like, why are you, uh, you know, spending this money on these avenues? Why are you paying your employees? Like, why are you not like putting it into the actual work at hand? So that's something that people don't really understand is that nonprofits and his overall message was also, you know, nonprofits need to start acting more like a business and they shouldn't be punished for doing that because like, why should they continue to, work under these really bad and poor conditions and expect that to be able to change the world. Well put. And, and, and yes, I, I mean, the Dan, Dan really changed the way that a lot of people see the nonprofit world. Um, that was well summed up. And I think the the one, the one uh, sentence answer is stop, stop wanting people to lead with their heart and remember that the people who work at nonprofits also have to make money. Uh, yeah, is, is it? it's and, a real and that thing. Nonprofits do too. Right. Exactly. So uh, definitely go watch it. I, I love that this came up naturally in this episode. I, I'm a big <laughs> damn a lot of fan, nice. um, but before <laughs> we do need to go to the final question. I'll tell you what, because this is such a great idea. I do two different ep- uh, sort of episodes of this podcast. This is this is wonderful radio. All the listeners, thank you for still listening at this point. Uh, <laughs> I do two different episodes. These Friday ones are very much on brand, talking about mental health and stuff like that. The Mondays are supposed to be conversation starters. Why don't I invite you back and you and I can do an entire Monday episode about the nonprofit industry? How's that sound? Sure. That sounds great. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Well, uh, listeners, if you're still listening to this episode, stay tuned for that one. And uh, Serena, let's go to the final couple of questions. How's that sound? Sure. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, before we do that, one more time. Uh, oh, did you already shout it out? I've forgotten now. <laughs> we, <we've done> this. <laughs> oh, man. If you haven't, please 
go ahead and do your socials again in your website. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I did uh, before, but uh, yeah, I mean, you can find me under Serena Hope Sun, um, and uh, you can find Breaking Taboo under Breaking Taboo, uh, and then the website for that is breaking-taboo.org, and my website, my soon upcoming website is serena-sun.com. So I am, I go by two names, Serena Sun and Serena Hope Sun, um, and that's just because apparently there's a bunch of people with my name Serena Sun. So it was like getting confusing. <laughs> I was pointing people to like other people's websites without realizing it. So yeah, so <laughs> I wish I could simplify it, but you know. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for that. So the, the last couple of questions I ask every single time are these. Number one, uh, you kind of already touched on this. So, so we'll, this will be quicker, but uh, I still would love to hear if you have any other ones. During, not just during COVID, whenever you want to sort of think about it, what self-care habits work for Serena Hope Sun? Uh, so um, giving my time, I'm giving myself time to relax at the end of every day and not feeling guilty about it <laughs> was something that I had to actively work on <laughs> actually a lot um, because I always have a lot of work to do. So for everyone out there who, you know, uh, do have a lot of work and projects that they're working on, don't feel bad about giving yourself the time that you need to just do absolutely nothing or watch your shows or hang out or whatever, because you need that. Your brain absolutely needs that to recharge. Um, number two, taking walks. Like taking walks are so great. I never did this before, you know, every time before COVID, um, before quarantine, uh, I had, again, a purpose <laughs> for the taking the walks. I'd have like one hour or one hour and a half to go for my run and, you know, get my stretches in and like do a little bit of meditating. And I was always in a rush. And then I had another meeting to go to and like rush back and whatever. But I really learned to just take my time, give myself more time to just like take these walks or do whatever I want out in nature and not stress so much about constantly being on a schedule. Um, although I do live by my calendar, but uh, the key is to give myself a little bit more leeway time. Um, the second one um, is I did actually get involved in uh, a few things that I have been wanting to do. So for example, the podcast was always an idea, but quarantine was a perfect time to start it. So, you know, getting yourself involved in like little projects that, that you can do at home that you've always just kind of wanted to try out and kind of wanted to do, you know, that stuff is definitely, um, I think, very helpful as well. And um I don't know, just being really grateful for the simple things. I think COVID has really made us just take a hard look at, you know, um, all the hustle and bustle that we're used to, like, and just stopping that and just, the, you know, paying more attention to the things that are around us currently right now, you know, and being grateful for that. So I don't know, sometimes I almost feel like the universe, like, wanted to do this because the universe like okay you guys are going too fast like you guys are forgetting like what the you know real meaning of life is <laughs> or something at least you know I see that as a theory <laughs> um but it definitely made me more grateful for just the little things in life oh and then also of course relationships uh I know COVID has brought a lot of families closer together um, and I found time to, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, be with my family more as well, um, and friends and, and all of that. So I think, you know, um, that's really important also. Beautifully put. Thank you so much for, 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 that was a very thoughtful answer. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm thoughtful, I guess. You you mentioned that like multiple times. Well, yeah. you've been a you've been a fantastic guest, and I only have one more for you today. Sure. Um, and, and that is, we've now spent the last oh man, uh, over forty minutes it's hearing okay, you about. Can edit it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is all golden. Well, maybe part of that 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 random conversation, but but I mean, everything else is it's perfect for this. So yeah. uh, we we spent the, over forty minutes listening to all the amazing work you're doing and why we should all be following you and breaking taboo. But this is your chance to shout out a couple of people that influence you, whether it's a podcast you listen to or a book you're reading or a show you're watching, whatever you want. Shout out the things we should all go follow. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, because I actually, 
Um, I follow so many different people and so many different accounts. Um, currently, right now, uh, it's hard for me to think off the top of my head. Uh, but currently, right now, the ones that I can think of is actually some Asian AAPI, like so the hashtag stop AAPI hates, and also some Asian news accounts, um, like Next Shark on uh, Instagram, Asian feed, because there's a lot of things that happen in the Asian com- community in my community that I am not even I'm not aware of because we don't hear about it in mainstream media, period, you know, but there's like a whole world there um, uh, that that if it wasn't for honestly social media, uh, I wouldn't even know of all of these um, things that were occurring, you know, so um, so definitely, you know, if you have interest in uh, uh, what's going on with the AAPI community, AAPI, by the way, means Asian American Pacific Islander, some people don't know that. Um, but yeah, if you have interest in that community, follow those accounts. Serena, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been fantastic to learn about you and your organization. And thank you for all you're doing. Yeah, thank you so much, Jay. It's been so nice uh, being here with you and uh, having these amazing conversations. So yeah, thanks for opening up the conversation around these important topics. That's awesome what you do. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that it's not the only thing I do. Choose Your Struggle is an entire brand. I speak, I coach and consult. I have rock bottom storytellers. There's a lot going on. And sometimes I get to a project and I go, man, I just, I can't do all of this myself. So I turn to Fiverr. It's so easy to find incredible professionals who can help me out. I've hired people to help with marketing, help with SEO, help with my website. So much great stuff all on Fiverr. I even found Kid Mental who did the incredible theme song on Fiverr. So if you have a project that you need some help on, go check out Fiverr. Use the link in the show notes or my podcast website and you'll help the podcast in the process. Check them out today. Find me on social media. Check the link in the show notes or search for me, Jay Schiffman, on YouTube and LinkedIn and choose your struggle on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All right, we've come to the end of another episode of the Choose Your Struggle podcast. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Serena Hope Sun of Breaking Taboo. Her knowledge on this is so incredible. Uh, I, I, you, you heard it in the interview, but I, I so much enjoyed our conversation that we are already talking about. In fact, by this, the time this comes out, we'll probably already be scheduled a second conversation more around the nonprofit industry. That'll be a Monday episode. So keep an eye out for that, but uh, definitely check out all they're doing, whether through the links in the show notes or just search for breaking taboo and and Serena. I I found them all very easily. They're doing such great work. It's getting a lot of notice. So props to them and and thank you to them for all that they are doing. So uh, today in, in honor of Serena, We're going to use the press pause pack from Blurt uh, because when it comes to helping prevent suicide of of our loved ones and those close to us, helping someone literally press pause on their plans uh, and sit with sitting with them is one of the most important things we can do. And and that's going to be your your good egg. We'll get to that in a second. So here is the press pause pack. Uh, I've already shuffled. I I did not throw the cards around the room this week. Uh, So so you know, making progress. There is no such thing as perfect. You are perfectly imperfect. That is a wonderful card. and, And it's so true. You know, when it comes to Uh, The ways we compare ourselves to other people, obviously, look, it has been talked about to death that social media is terrible when it comes to presenting an honest look at people's lives, right? I mean, you know, you, you would think based on just social media that people's relationships are perfect, that... Um, their lives are nothing but happiness, right? And, and it can make you feel super insecure about where you are in life and who you are and what you're doing. And so this is a really important thing to remember is that there is no perfect. And, and, and the best we can do is be the best of ourselves, lead the best life we can. Uh, I personally think uh, that that means having a great impact on other people. But for some people, that can also just be doing their best every day. And that is commendable. So that's a great card. Now, as promised, your 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 good egg today has to do with all of this, um, specifically Serena's work around suicide prevention 
And your good egg this week is just going to be reaching out to somebody in your life and checking in on them. Maybe it's someone you haven't heard from in a while. Um, I just talked to a, a good friend of mine who, who lost a friend recently. And, um, you know, those little touch points uh, are so important and get overlooked in terms of just reminding people that there are other people in their life who care. And that can be the difference between that feeling of extreme loneliness, that feeling of isolation, and not. It's just that simple text of, hey, how you doing? What's up with you? You know, let's let's catch up. So um, that's your good egg. It's a pretty easy one, I think. Don't be scared. Send the text. Make the phone call. Uh, you know, don't, I guess, send an email, but you know, do, do better than an email. <laughs> uh, but most importantly, as always, be vulnerable, show your empathy, spread your love, and choose your struggle.